Good afternoon. How's it going, Aaron? Good. How are you, Dana? Good. We're just rolling because I figure it'll be more fun that way. Cool. Perfect. <laughs> it's been a long time. How have you been? I've been very good. All right. Well, I'm really happy that you reached out because I haven't done this Mind by Design podcast since I want to say April. So it's been about six months. I've taken a wow. little hiatus. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm honored to be the one that uh, gets it going again or helps you. Yeah, yeah me too, because I, I really love doing this. But to be honest, it takes a lot of time of which I've had. Little... It... <laughs> yeah, well, because you have to You're you know busy. do the interview and then I have to like edit or, you know, take out the beginning or whatever. And then I have to transfer it to video. I have to like transfer the Zoom over to youtube and put that up and put the podcast and make a description and all the things so it does you know it takes a bit of time but what i really love is on the back end like once it's up what i really use these for is to you know when i'm giving a referral to a family i go oh you know i think you need some occupational therapy um, I've actually done a little interview with an occupational therapist and his company, Laughing Giraffe, and I, um, why don't you check them out a bit before you make the call? Because I feel like that makes people feel like they've already made a connection with you before, totally. you know, it feels like more friendly. <laughs> Almost as if, you know, they were able to talk to you and, and ask you all these questions and, and get all that information and get to know your approach a little bit and your energy or, you know, your, your yeah. personality a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I did one where I was just talking about the assessment process and um, kind of just all the bits and pieces of the assessment process and how you figure out if you even need your child to be evaluated. And so a lot of times when parents contact me now and they're just asking questions and wondering about it, I just send them the video that I did and then they feel like they heard it straight from me they see like my personality, they can feel like whether or not it'll, it'll be a good fit and get the information and, you know, to determine if they want to take the next steps. So yeah, I find these very helpful. Cool. Yeah. How many have you done? How many? Mm -hmm. Probably 20 something. It's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, but yeah, I've been really busy and I'm glad to get this back going because I do, there are like a number of people, I keep a list, like the different people that I want to make sure that I connect with. And I'm trying to um, collect people from all different kinds of um, helping professions so that mm -hmm. um, I have kind of a, uh, and I'm putting it together on my resource list on my website. It's kind of already there, but it's not in the format that I want it, but that's kind of like the next project because I'd like people to be able to find um, uh, these uh, video resources and podcast resources really easily. And so I'm adding them to my resource page, but that's like a slowly but surely. So I'm trying to like work full time, manage this business, do the business, and do the podcast and have a family and <laughs> stay fit, you know, all the things. Totally. So, yeah. The juggling act. Yeah. Well, um, so Aaron, Aaron DiNardo, he has a company called Laughing Giraffe Therapy. Mm -hmm. Right. I didn't get it wrong. And it's Laughing Giraffe Occupational Perfect. Therapy. Okay, good. Because um, Laughing Giraffe Therapy is a place of occupational therapy. And I would love to hear just about your approach to practice and Tell me a little bit about your clinic, where it's located, and who you serve. Absolutely. Um, and and I'll, I'll say, I actually have had speech therapy there, too, for a few years. I was partnering with a group called Peninsula Associates, who are amazing. Uh, they outgrew the space that I offered them. And actually, I kind of you know helped them negotiate to get into a building right across the parking lot. So they're still right next to me. I still work closely with them. Uh, but I do intend to have my own speech therapist eventually too. I've been looking around and it's it's challenging. But um, so right now I've got six OTs that work for me. Uh, we're located at 100 O'Connor Drive um, in San Jose. It's uh, right near O'Connor Hospital. And if, if you know folks don't know where that is, a lot of people know where Santana Row is. It's just like a few few minutes down. Well, actually, like you know, down San Carlos and or Stevens Creek um, from Santana Row Valley Fair Mall. So that's kind of the area that it's in. 
And Laughing Draft Therapy is actually going to be six years old in what? Today's the ninth. Uh, in ten days, on October nineteenth, uh, two thousand and fifteen, was when I saw my first um, kiddo there. Uh, I was just treating there alone at, at that time, and since then, like I say, I've hired um, five more therapists. We have uh, two school contracts. We work. Uh, we provide all the OT services at the Morgan Autism Center uh, and the Achieve Kids Palo Alto campus. So those are both non-public schools, uh, and we've been serving uh, actually, yeah, Morgan Center the entire time I've been open and um, Achieve Kids. Now this is our third year out there, and we have three treatment gyms. Uh, actually, we have four rooms. One of them, like I say, you know has been used for speech and will be used for speech again. Uh, so mainly three, you know, OT rooms with suspended equipment. You know, we're very much a kind of a, well, I was, I'm going to say we're, we're a classic sensory integration gym, you know, meaning that we, you know, we do all the same stuff that you would see at other sensory integration gyms. So, you know, including, you know, lots of movement, swinging and working with the vestibular system, lots of games, lots of sensory activities. Uh, we've got a little room called the moon room. It's got lots of pillows in it and you can dim the lights and see stars. And, um, you know, so it's kind of a relaxation, chill integration room. Um, so, you know, and we, we do things like um, uh, reflex integration work um, and, uh, you know, we, we very much lean towards um, connection, engagement, relationship type of approach. So uh, DIR floor time um, is, is kind of, the, you know, the, the model that we follow there or, you know, or our approach is very similar to that, right? So it's very much about, you know, how can we connect with this child and use the therapeutic relationship as our most powerful tool? Um, we, we do the Will Barker Thera Pressure Protocol. We, um, many of us are trained in, um, well, actually everyone's trained in integrated listening systems and we have the equipment there so we can see if that works for a child, that auditory integration program. Um, and, you know, some of us have various trainings in things like, you know, Balavizex or um, the astronaut training, you know, various stuff. Uh, I've got one therapist, Margarita Gomez, who has a lot of experience working with early intervention, birth to three, so we can serve children um, that early. I personally don't have a lot of experience um, with the really young ones, um, but we see, you know, kids anywhere from birth to well, I say kids, you know, birth to 18, and, you know, we, we definitely do see some adolescents there, uh, and even some young adults. Um, we've seen, you know, uh, individuals up to 20, 21, 22 years old there. Not as much. I would say the main kind of range is, you know, four to 10, a lot of our kids, um, lots of school age kids. Um, and, you know, pretty much, you know, uh, well, I was gonna say all diagnoses, but that's not true. We actually don't really see a lot of kids with, you know, like like um, really involved physical disabilities, like cerebral palsy, a muscular dystrophy, or something like that. They'd probably go to CCS or, or another clinic that works with that. But mostly kids with sensory processing disorder, lots of children on the spectrum for sure, um, ADD and ADHD. Um, regulation challenges, gross and fine motor challenges, um, learning challenges, social skills. So kind of those are the areas that we work on. And it's yeah. very, very, very play-based. Thank you. Okay, so I am envisioning, you know, sometimes I say to a family when I've done an evaluation and I say to the family, you know, I really think that you may need OT. You know, and mm -hmm. sometimes they have no idea what I'm talking about. And so if I am recommending OT and this family is brand new to really even understanding what it is that that means, like usually I'm referring for either like a lot of sensory processing and self-regulation challenges, fine motor also, but more often than not, it's like attention and sensory and self-regulation. But Talk to me a little bit from your OT perspective. Like, what do you say to families who are brand new to even understanding what occupational therapy is and who it is useful for and why? Sure. Um, that can end up being a, 
a, a very long uh, answer. Um, so usually how I, the first thing I usually do is I clear up the misunderstanding, the very common misunderstanding around the word occupation or occupational, right? Because the first thing people think of is, you know, kids, jobs, that doesn't make any sense. So, okay, that's vocational therapy. There's people that do that. And I describe in, in occupational therapy, the word, uh, you know, actually refers to meaningful activity or human activity, any meaningful activity that a human being engages in. Um, and then, you know, I would, also, I would, I would often give, um, you know, I, I talk about the, the, the breadth of occupational therapy and how it can be used in so many different settings and with so many um, different populations and children and the school setting and this clinic setting only being one. Um, I, I would often use as an example of occupation uh, the, the example, because I have also um, worked at uh, Valley Medical Center during doing neuro rehab. Um, so working with stroke and brain injury and a little bit of uh, experience with spinal cord injury early in my career. Uh, so I would often use the example of, so say, a stroke patient that had some hemiparesis, um, you know, but could still, you know, stand. Um, and, you know, maybe uh, as their treatment, I would use the occupation of standing at the sink and brush, brushing their teeth. And that is an occupation, right? And actually, these types of ADLs, activities of daily living, are some of the occupations that we overlook the most, right? That we take for granted until we lose our ability to do them. And then it's like, all I want to be able to do is brush my own teeth, right? And not have someone do it for me or not have to sit at bedside and spit into a pan or, or whatever, right? I want to be able to just go into the bathroom, stand there and brush my teeth. So I'm motivated. This becomes a meaningful thing to me. So that is an occupation. That is meaningful activity in a large, uh, you know, hospital working with a, a patient like that. That might be the entire, let's say, 30, 30 minute treatment for that day, helping that uh, patient get safely to the, the bathroom, standing them up at the sink putting them in a position that's safe, but that's also challenging and working their leg to help the nerves come back and, you know, help them regain function in the leg, maybe in the arm, maybe we position it on the um, sink in a certain way that's bearing weight into it, activating that whole side of the body while they're brushing teeth. And, you know, you could also be working on visual things and, you know, a spatial, um, you know, perception, you could be working on cognition. I mean, it just depends on, you know, all of the, the, the areas that you're working on um, with a patient. Uh, but I, I often will use that example to describe occupation and how you would use occupation as a treatment tool. Um, and then I say, what is, and I'll sometimes ask this question, what is the primary occupation for children? And most people will say either school and some will say play, exploration. And that's the answer, yes. The primary occupation for children is play, exploration. And that could be in the form of, you know, uh, arts and um, and sports and stuff too, um, but then certainly school um, is is a primary occupation for children. So within that context, hopefully that helps people understand that when kids come to occupational therapy, when you look at a session, it might often look like we're just playing with kids. We're in there swinging them, you know, we're doing sensory stuff with them, jumping on trampolines, on giant therapy balls. We might be brushing them, they might be wearing a pressure vest, we might be, um, you know, we might get, be getting really loud, climbing, jumping, right? That's all the kind of gross motor stuff working with the sensory systems, you know, that help them with, um, you know, with body awareness and, you know, coordination um, and gross motor activities. Uh, and then we also might be, you know, playing a visual perceptual game. We've got, we've got a whole room full of board games at my clinic. Um, or, you know, yeah, we might be doing some things with the eyes. I always throw in um, problem solving. I always leave a lot of space for, you know, and time for kids to work on problem solving, you know, within whatever else we're working on. Um, how can I throw in little challenges here and there that are working on them gathering information from the, from the environment and, and, you know, and, and, uh, uh, producing what we call an adaptive response. Anyway, I, I think I'm going off a little bit from what you said. I'm talking more about my approach, but that's kind of how I 
describe occupation. Um, and, 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 and then there's obviously a huge emphasis on sensory processing in my description of what we do. So we are working on uh, the, the sensory systems, of which there are eight, actually. A lot of people think, you know, five, the typical five that we use to gather information from, you know, outside of us, from our environment. But there's actually three internal ones, right? We've got vestibular, which is, you know, kind of located in our inner ear, and it gives us a sense of how we're moving through space, right? What's our position in space? Um, and, you know, it's kind of related to you know, like car sickness and some kids get car sickness. It can be, you know, oh, any of the sensory systems can be over or under responsive. And we, you know, we would do, uh, you know, certain activities depending on which, which this, you know, which was true for a certain child. Um, but the vestibular system, I usually go into detail and describe how important it is. A lot of people haven't heard much about it, but the vestibular system is actually the first sensory system that we can um, identify like through ultrasound in utero you can see it forming at like six weeks in utero and that's you know that tells us there's there's no accidents right in development in what what appears first right so these bony structures the bony labyrinth um, of the vestibular system appears six weeks in utero and you know starts to come online early you know before the other sensory systems too so what that tells us is all the other sensory systems are built on top of the vestibular vestibular system. There's neural connections to all the other sensory systems. And so if that's offline, all the rest of them can be affected too. So that's why you see occupational therapists working a lot with the vestibular system, very foundational. And Jane Ayers is, is really, you know, um, credited with, you know, kind of, you know, making this common knowledge, at least for OTs. And then there's the proprioceptive system, which is receptors throughout our body and our joints, muscles, tendons, and ligaments, which give us uh, information about the stretch on our, on our muscles, the position of our joints, the position of our body. It's related to body awareness and coordination. And then the, the eighth sensory system is interoception, right? Like sensing hunger and thirst and sensing, um, do we have to go to the bathroom or not, right? So those three internal um, sensory systems uh, are worked on a lot in occupational therapy and they're not nearly as well known as the other sensory systems but of course we work on those as well we definitely work on visual processing um, as and you know I'm sure you see a lot of kids that uh, you know that either are getting uh, vision therapy or you might see something and refer them to vision therapy or um, it's you know that's very common we see a lot of that today auditory processing obviously is a, a, a challenge for a lot of the kids that we see um, and then tactile, you know, we've got in OT, we definitely have a lot of kids that have what we call tactile defensiveness or at least um, some sense of tap tactile hypersensitivity and they don't like to touch certain, uh, uh, certain textures, right? And this can really take them out of typical age appropriate uh, activities, right, that a lot of their friends and peers are doing, right? Um, you know, as can, can any, any uh, uh, sensory hypersensitivity. And, and what can happen there, of course, is if they're not participating in all these, you know, really valuable, important developmental activities that most kids get in, you know, at home or in preschool or, you know, in kindergarten and as they start school, um, they can fall further and further behind, right? So this kid doesn't want to go out and touch mud. This kid doesn't want to touch paint. This kid doesn't want to touch glue. And so they're not doing all the same. These are, you know, those are just some real common examples, um, but it manifests, you know, a lot, you know, a lot, you know, in many other ways than that. But, you know, if there's any kind of sensory sensitivity that takes them out of, you know, activities on the playground or art activities right or any kind of exploration the gap can get wider between them and their typically developing peers because as those you know as they participate in these things they're they're developing their nervous system they're learning they're growing right that the brain is maturing and if they don't get these opportunities then they can fall farther behind um, I think about that in terms of writing also, like just writing. And I'm wondering, that's just made me think, I'm wondering, especially because everybody was in distance learning for so long and doing everything on a keyboard, are you seeing some underdevelopment of handwriting skills kind of across the board? And I just was thinking about a lot of times when kids have trouble with writing, they tend to not want to write, so they don't practice as much, so they don't get better. 
you know, so they don't, and same thing with reading, you know, it's like the same, whenever they don't want to do something, we have to somehow make them participate and practice because they're not going to build those neural pathways unless they're getting more practice. Absolutely. God, I have, I have a lot to say about that. <laughs> The two the two main areas I saw really affected by COVID and distance learning um, m in many areas certainly. Wait, let, me so guess. let me guess. Yeah. Attention. <laughs> yes. Okay, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> that was attention and fine motor yep. are the two, are the two biggest that I saw affected. Yeah, and of course, like a, you know, social. Um, yeah, you know, we we we've been thrust more into this virtual world that. Um, that I think we were, you know, we were already going too much into. If you look at my website, uh, the very front, the, the homepage, I uh, have what's what I call my giraffe philosophy, and it's got just a list of values and uh, things, you know, things that I think, you know, are kind of harming our kids, and things that I think are good for our kids, and screen time, totally. And I think everybody knows that, and we can't we can't avoid all screen time, but you know, minimizing it. Um, but nature connection. We have, in a very relatively short period of time, we have substituted being out and connected to nature with three-dimensional objects, right? Fresh air, sunshine, interacting with natural objects. And now a lot of our kids aren't getting that very much anymore. And instead, it's been substitute, substituted by this virtual two-dimensional screen <laughs> that offers fragmented information. You know, the brain really isn't really designed to process. Uh, we're more designed to process natural objects. So it's confusing all of our brains, not just kids, but definitely kids. So those are the two areas I saw affected most. Um, so, it, you know, definitely, uh, you know, from an OT perspective, if you've got a child that doesn't enjoy writing, you're right that, you know, everybody wants to feel successful you know and be good at what they're trying to do and and not struggle at it too much and not have to put too much effort towards it you know something right so if a child for whatever reason if any of their sensory systems are offline or you know i haven't even talked about um the print, unintegrated primitive reflexes that's another huge piece i won't go into it there but if they've got some uh, primitive reflexes that should have been integrated by a certain time but are still active that can cause a lot of challenges and so yeah then writing is is hard for any number of reasons and of course i don't want to do it right I, i'm not good at it i don't get good feedback about it it's stressful my hand hurts i get tired i want to go do something else instead so and that's just that's natural that's human i mean i do that i avoid the things that i that i'm not good at and that are hard and I gravitate towards the stuff i'm good at so it's totally understandable so with a child who really doesn't like writing very much at all, you know, my approach would probably be, you know, is there, is there a tactile challenge? We might be doing a brushing program or something like that, or, you know, other ways to work on, uh, you know, on, on, on the, uh, a tactile, uh, you know, kind of challenge. Um, you know, definitely would be working with the proprioceptive system. There's a lot of muscles and tiny little muscles and joints in the hands. If the proprioceptive system is offline, then coordinating all of those is very difficult. And that's when we start to see, you know, really funky pencil grasp patterns. Um, so we would be working with the proprioceptive system as well. Um, and it's not just about strength. A lot of people think, you know, strength in a hand, a hand, a child might have perfectly fine strength, but it's more the coordination. How are they using all those joints and muscles together? This is very, very intricate, <laughs> complex thing that we have here called the hand. Um, but I certainly wouldn't be spending a lot of my OT time actually probably writing, right? Generally, what we do in OT, a typical session might be, you know, it was really playful. We would start out with a fun, you know, gross motor activity, get all the sensory systems warmed up. We might do some more specific work, you know, with the systems that I've talked about. We might do some reflex integration work or, you know, what, whatever, whatever is called for. Um, and then we would do some fun activities that challenge the hands um, in, you know, in the same way, you know, challenge the hands in the way that are going to help with writing, but but the activity isn't actually writing. And we've, you know, we, you know, every kid is different. We've got, you know, we've got a huge uh, smorgasbord of choices um, that that you know, and and as OTs, we understand the hand, and we understand the you know the arches and the muscles and the patterns, and what activities challenge the hand in what way, and so we choose from those 
And then, but we also want it to be something obviously that the child enjoys. So they're just here having fun, but we're working on their hands. And then we would definitely end the session with a little bit of writing, right? Because we want to, we, we, we end up, uh, you know, actually working on the, the functional skill that we want to work on, but we do a bunch of other stuff leading up to that that's very fun. Um, and, you know, and so, so all of the, you know, all of the areas that, that, that will eventually help that child write get addressed in a fun way. And then we tie it all together with some functional writing at the end. And the, the, the child is usually willing to do that. But, you know, to, to have a child come to OT and just like have them sit there and write is, well, quite frankly, that's an occupational therapy that, that you know, I don't, I, I don't want to say anything critical, but that would not be the way that I would address it. And, and I don't think you do see very many OTs do that because we understand, you know, um, there's, there's a lot more stuff we can, we can do to, um, to work on it that, that keeps it fun for the child. Yeah. So if somebody yeah. is coming to um, occupational therapy and, you know, maybe, I don't know, they could have any number of things, but if they come to, um, how do you, I guess, here's the question. How do you um, determine what it is to, that they need? Do you always do a comprehensive assessment or are there ways that you go about trying to figure out um, what you need to work on without a full assessment? And then what are some of the more common outcomes? Like what are the like kind of more common goals that you're working on just so that parents can kind of understand like what do you get out of occupational therapy they're coming in they're doing this activity these activities that are helping the student to be more functional in something that's specific so like what are some of the more common outcomes uh, or things that kids are working on sure sure yeah great questions um so my um my philosophy about testing is that it's obviously very important um and you know but i like some spaciousness with within the choice to test and how testing can be done yeah. there i think there are some clinics that's kind of like you know if you come to them and start services they will do like a full-on comprehensive assessment um that's that's kind of one philosophy i'm not like that especially if you know if they've got some relatively recent testing um from that someone else has done you know Give me that. I like, you know, obviously want to take a look at that. I don't need to repeat that, you know, if it's been done within the last year or something like that. But even if you don't, um, you know, there's, you know, I understand there's there's expense uh, involved, um, and you know, a full a full huge, you know, comprehensive um, test isn't always necessary. So actually, on my website, we've got listed like four different levels of testing that we can do. Anywhere from, yeah, you know, we, we use things like the Brunix Osteretsky test of motor skills, the Peabody. Um, we've got two um, sensory tests that we use, the sensory processing measure and the sensory profile. Uh, we use Lucy Miller's goal um, assessment. Uh, those are some of the main ones that we use. And we can do those and give you a full write up. Um, you know, obviously, it would be you know, include parent interview and just you know you know kind of functional observation in the in the in the gym as well in the the, the, the OT gym. Uh, you know, and probably would include a school observation as well. I mean, obviously, would if that's one of the reasons that the child's coming to us. But uh, you know, it, you know, even if it's not, you know, we might decide to do that. So we can do all of that, and we do do all of that. But we don't require all of that. Some kid, you know, some some. Sometimes we could do uh, even more just kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, informal observation. Um, and, and, you know, and oh, and I, one other thing I want to say about my philosophy and, and, and our clinic is that we encourage parents to be in on the sessions with their kids. And that's not just at the, be not just at the beginning. Like, you know, I was going to say we can, you know, we can have the, the parent there during our, our testing and during our kind of informal observations. And, and we can, you know, point things out to them too, or or tell them later if it's sensitive information, and we don't want to say it in front of the child. Um, but even ongoing, you know, if if a child's getting weekly sessions, we want the parents to come and stay and be in on the session with their kids. Um, some places I've been told don't really encourage that, or some even discourage it. You know, not all parents want to do that. They want to, you know, take a break or go go shopping or real quick while their kids <laughs> in, in in therapy. So you know, everyone's 
you know, kind of got a different approach, but we definitely encourage. We would, we love it when the parents uh, are willing to stay and watch how we work with their child. We can explain things. Why are we doing things? What are we seeing um, behaviorally? This, you know, this is might be something. That, you know, this is something that works with this child here in the clinic. Maybe you could try that at home. Right here's activities that you can take home. So very much believe in this connection. Uh, you know, we we give. I don't know, homework, home play, whatever you want to call it. But this, you know, this idea that one hour of therapy a week is fine and helpful to a certain degree, but if you can take it home and have a, a bridge between uh, the clinic and, and the home and the school, um, that's more powerful, obviously. Love that. Yeah, love that. Yeah. One. And so um, just, you know, what else did I want to say? Yeah, so any level all the way to, we can do a, a brief write-up for a, um, for assessment, or we could even just, you know, do a really brief informal observation and, and give the parent, you know, some, the information verbally. I mean, we're kind of willing to do. I like that. Level. Yeah. yeah, I like that because, I mean, a lot of times uh, families, I'll talk to them and we're trying to decide whether or not they need assessment. And oftentimes, especially for really little kids where, you know, they might yes. be like five, six or seven and I'm thinking and their parents are concerned about their reading. Let's just say, you know, I will be like, go get some reading intervention. Has your kid had any re reading intervention yet? No, go do that first. You know, oh, you have a second language in the home and you're not sure if there's like some confusion there. Oh, your kid was on distance learning for the past year and wasn't really practicing reading. You know, go get some intervention first before we do an assessment, um, because often oftentimes you don't need a whole assessment unless you need it for the for information that you don't have or because you need it for some kind of specific diagnosis to get something out of it right. you know but right. i love i mean a lot of times i'm trying to also because like this is private practice work and so everything costs money for these families who are just trying to help their struggling students in whatever way so i'm like how can we efficiently get you the support you need in the most cost effective way. And so I like the flexibility, especially like say if I gave a full assessment and a parent paid for this whole thing. And one of the outcomes of that was like, okay, here are some sensory areas that I'm seeing. Here are some attention issues. Here are some self-regulation things. Here's how it's uh here how it's manifesting at school or at home, you know, and I think that occupational therapy would be helpful for you, you could probably take all that information and have a pretty good idea how you're gonna help that kid without doing your own full evaluation totally. of something else. Great, I, I really like that. So so then the next, wanna, one, go ahead. Yeah, can I say one more thing too? Because you, you know, as you talk to me and my philosophy, you'll hear relationship you know, emphasized over and over and over again. That's you know, that's an important part of my, my private life is just, just human connection and deep, you know, relationships. That's like a, a part of why, a big part of why we're here, I think, right? And so that's who I am. That's how I relate with my employees and my and the, and the parents and the kids. It's, you know, definitely about connection. It's about kids feeling safe and seen and heard and to know that they've got power in their world, you know, as much as we're able to give them right we can't hand over complete power to children um that would be irresponsible as adults but i find places as much as much as i can to give children power i think that's important to them um and so because of all of that um i don't think that formal testing is the greatest start to a relationship so i will often you know even if i'm gonna do formal testing probably at least two sessions will be informal observation come in let's get to know each other let's play i can gather a lot of information just by watching a child in the gym and having them do all kinds of fun stuff so i kind of start there and then you know once there's at least a couple of weeks of of some connection then we can bust out the you know the the, the the formal testing material if we need to but to to do that right away feels kind of cold to me and i don't think it's it's not the right place that i want to start my relationship with that kid i love that too there are so many things i could say about that but i'm not going to <laughs> right now what i'm going to say is okay so what are some of the outcomes like once you start working with kids what are some of the com more common goals just so that parents have an idea of like 
what is it you're working on and what is going to happen at the end of this? Or like, why are you doing this therapy? Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, and of course it really depends on the individual child and kind of their functional level, their cognition, their diagnosis. So we have some, uh, you know, some, some children and students with autism that are very involved that come to our clinic. And, and like I say, we're also out at two schools. Um, and that's a lot of the type of student that we see. So, I mean, regulation, you mentioned it before, is a, is a huge foundational goal for, for them. So, you know, a lot of times these types of students are, are very distracted and um, very anxious um, and, you know, a lot of movement, a lot of, um, you know, kind of compensatory actions just to, you know, to try to self-soothe, right? We call it stimming. Some people don't like that um that term but we have a lot of kids that, that are moving and jumping and bouncing so we do a lot of activity to get them in their body to calm and soothe the nervous system and just get them a little bit more in a place to uh, connect with other people gather information from their environment produce some kind of a functional response so you know definitely regulation for uh, many of our children um, you mentioned it before, you know, fine motor and handwriting is definitely, uh, you know, what a lot of people who have heard about pediatric occupational therapy think of like, oh, you guys are the hand, you know, you're the handwriting people. Right. And that's certainly, <laughs> it's certainly true. That's definitely our domain, part of our domain and what we're known for. So, um, you know, so definitely, got, you know, have kids that come in for, for that kind of thing. And, you know, and, and challenging handwriting, you know, can make school very difficult. Although, like you pointed out, you know, nowadays we, we just get them on keyboards as as soon as possible but what we find is i mean we don't ever get a student coming to us that has handwriting challenges and that's it right i mean there's a bunch of foundational other things going on that need to be addressed that are that are you know contributing to the handwriting challenge so we, we will sometimes you know get get a call and say oh you know my my child has trouble handwriting and and so we'll say you know we'll gather some information on the phone if it's appropriate we get them in there and then we start to explain to the student you know there's probably a lot more going on here um and so that is um you know so so more growth so so that's kind of fine motor um, for for the handwriting and let me just say one other main area that fine motor you know functional area that fine motor could affect is self-care skills, of course, right? So we've got kids uh, that we work on, you know, clothing fasteners and, you know, buttoning and zipping, um, you know, and even, you know, maybe spreading, uh, you know, simple food prep or something like that, spreading peanut butter. Well, we've got to be careful with peanut butter because of, because uh, of, um, uh, allergies exactly um so we don't have we don't have peanut butter there um but you know you know basically what i'm saying you know maybe slice some bread or slice a banana but you know functional skills like that um for for self-care and adls um gross motor is a big one um we've got kids that come in that are just a little bit not quite in their bodies right so participating in um sports is difficult for them and that's a you know that's a really important um you know, developmentally appropriate activity that's good for most kids. Uh, you know, depending on, you know, there's lots of sports to choose from. So certainly, you know, not every kid, you know, needs to be playing, uh, you know, football or, or baseball or, or basketball or, or whatever. But to find, you know, some kind of sport, it doesn't have to be competitive, but some kind of a movement activity that they can, you know, channel their energy into and help them develop, you know, uh, motorically, uh, it's really important. Um, and so, you know, some kids end up, uh, you know, we end up um, uh, um, uh, recommending is the word I'm looking for. Swimming is really good for kids. Um, you know, sometimes gymnastics, but you know, when you when you have things that involve a lot of waiting in line, that's tough for some kids, you know, if they have to like wait their turn, kids with attention challenges and the need to move, not always the best. Um, so anyway, I mean, I could go on about that, but, you know, gross motor ability to participate even in just playground activities, right? Not even sports, but can the kid, can the, the child that we're working with go out and play a game with their peers and, you know, do well enough to feel good about it. Um, so, you know, coordination, balance, postural control, um, 
and, you know, are, are things that we work on for sure. And that, that falls under the, you know, the larger category of gross motor. Um, and then attention is, is definitely a huge one that we, that we work on. Um, so how can we get this child in their body focused, which usually, you know, is, is oftentimes related to maybe the, um, the uh, primitive reflexes, um, you know, a lot of times the auditory processing um, and, and the regulation. So, you know, we kind of see what's causing this a difficulty with this child um, for in attending and, and try to address that. Those are really some of the main things and social skills, certainly social skills and, and, and regulation as it, um, you know, as it affects uh, behavior. Um, we do get calls sometimes for kids that are, that are struggling in preschool that, um, that just can't figure out how to, um, express themselves, right, and their frustrations in that environment in a way that, you know, that makes everyone feel safe. So sometimes there are kids that are asked to, to even leave preschools. Um, and so we get, we get, you know, parents that are pretty concerned, of course, saying, you know, my child just can't quite keep themselves together. We want them to be able to attend in preschool. You know, what can they do? What can we do? And that's a child that we would get in there and probably, you know, get them regulated, get them into their body. And obviously, I'm sure you've seen this. Um, with younger children um, with speech delays, um, you know, and, and especially ones that, you know, really the cognition is pretty typical, but the ability, the expressive language is not there, right? That can create so much frustration. And that would obviously be a case where we would probably involve speech therapy, get that child the ability to express their needs, express their frustrations, um, and not have to kind of lash out. So, that, you know, and then so that 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 comes to working with with other um, disciplines like yourself, like speech. Um, so, yeah, I think so those, are, those are some of the main areas. Yeah, that's I would have said probably the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, speech, I, I feel like every speech pathologist is full right now. It's like you have a major shortage. I have kids that I'm referring for speech and like, I cannot find people who are open. It's, That's why I can't find one for my clinic right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I called, um, I called the, what is it? Mills Peninsula Associates. Peninsula Associates. Peninsula Associates. Yeah. I called them or I, I emailed recently and they're like totally full. Oh man! I know, I know. Uh, and they have, you know, they have more locations too. So they've got one in in the South Bay now, but they've got one in uh, Menlo Park, one in San Mateo, and I even I think still have a therapist over in Santa Cruz. And yeah, I think they're all full. Yeah, it's crazy. How are you guys doing? Or do you have space? Do you have like some openings if parents needed to get their student in for OT? We, we actually do because you know. Uh, we were closed for so long um, and, you know, so we reopened, I mean, it's been a little while now. We reopened, I think in April, um, but you know, not everybody was state felt safe to come back yet. And of course, you know, of course we're all masked up still, all of my therapists and my office manager were all vaccinated. Um, but we've, you know, and, and it's nice. Well, I mean, people feel differently about vaccinations. I happen to support them. I would like to see as many people vaccinated as possible. So I'm excited that at the time of, of this podcast that we're doing that Pfizer looks like they're on the verge of getting approved for the vaccination for um, uh, down to five years old. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, but we've got kids, you know, anyone under 12, obviously that comes to our clinic uh, can't be vaccinated at this point. So we're all still masked up. Um, and so it's been slow to to ramp back up, um, but I have I did hire uh, two new occupational therapists uh, a couple of months ago, and we've been uh, filling their their caseload. Um, but we do still have some space, and I probably will hire another one relatively soon. So, at like a, like like I say, at the time of of this podcast um, in early October, um, we do have some space that probably won't always be like that. And hopefully no more variants, right? I know, right? Yeah. I've been really busy too. I've been hi hiring, trying to find people to hire because I've been pretty busy myself, but it's, it's hard. It's hard to hire people. I mean, I feel like everybody moved away. <laughs> yes. They're like, <laughs> if we can we can be remote. We're not going to deal with these yeah. crazy housing costs. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I think we covered quite a bit here. I was really 
looking forward to talking to you. And I, I think this is a really great conversation. I hope it'll be helpful for parents um, who are wondering what occupational therapy is and whether or not um, the service would potentially be a good fit for their child or adolescent. Um, so you, uh, again, Aaron DiNardo, Laughing Giraffe Therapy, and you have a website. What's the website? It's just laughinggiraffetherapy.com. Perfect. Great. And yeah. is that the best Easy way to go kind of along? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Look there and then you can, uh, you can get the phone number from there or whatever uh, and give us a call and we can talk to you more. And you know, some people like to come and um, kind of tour the clinic before they decide to have their child come there. Totally understandable. We do that. Um, so great. We're, we're easy going. And, uh, you know, maybe if I could just quickly mention, we have, you know, some other things I, I've also, uh, and, and I can't remember if I mentioned, did I mention that the, yeah, the clinic's about to be six years old. I think I mentioned that. Um, and when I, when I first opened it, I decided that I wanted to also use the space um, for kind of community building too. So we have had yoga there in the past. We don't anymore. Um, uh, and we've had, we used to have an in-person med meditation group. Um, we don't right now, but I've, I actually offer two virtual meditation groups. Um, and so you can always call and get information about those, or there's, there's information about them on the website. Um, we actually host a drum circle once a month. It is, hasn't been at the clinic since whatever, early last year, but it's out at the Rose Garden in San Jose once a month. Um, and some, sometimes some of the families and, and kids come out and it's a lot of other people from the community as well. Drumming and music, I haven't even talked about that. Another super powerful, um, you know, uh, activity uh, that involves, you know, the sensory systems, movement and connection and rhythm. Um, that is very healing, very grounding, very regulating. Um, and then we also have a nonviolent communication practice group, uh, which if anyone doesn't know anything about NVC, you can, there's all kinds of stuff on the internet about it. It's just a wonderful um, approach practice for connecting deeply with other human beings. It's very much a part of who I am and a very much a part of how I connect with children and, and how we function in the clinic. So I just wanted to mention all of those things. They, they, those other offers are, you know, in line with the vision, the philosophy, the energy of, of the clinic. I love that. And um, how did you come up with the name Laughing Giraffe there? <laughs> good question. And a lot of people ask that, which means it, it, it's a good name, right? And it's a good logo. It gets people, it peaks, it peaks curiosity. It actually comes from NVC, nonviolent communication. And the man, Marshall Rosenberg, who, developed nonviolent communication and taught it for 40 plus years in many countries before he passed away and it's still practiced in many countries across the world. Um, he chose the giraffe to as a symbol to represent when we're in our hearts, when we're empathic, when we're receptive, when we're compassionate, non-judgmental. And he chose it because the giraffe is actually the land mammal with the largest heart, even larger than the elephant, because it's got to, you know, uh, kind of get all that blood up that big long neck against gravity. So it's got a larger heart than the elephant. The only animal that has a larger heart is the blue whale. Um, and so he just chose it, you know, it's a kind of a kind, gentle animal. It's got you know, perspective because of the long neck. It can look down and kind of see the big picture and just be spacious and kind and receptive uh, and caring and um, heart centered. And that is, that's the energy of the clinic. So um, when I started thinking about a name, immediately giraffe popped into my head and, and it just felt right immediately. <laughs> I'm laughing just because <laughs> I'm laughing just you know what because it, it, it laughing giraffe it's got the um it's got the rhyme there it flows and just yeah I mean, who doesn't like a laughing giraffe right yeah, I don't know <laughs> and on that we will end our podcast today <laughs> the laughing well, giraffe well thank you so much for joining me and of course it's always a pleasure to talk to you and I appreciate your time thanks Jan I appreciate you too all right. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. okay. Bye. Bye.